Welcome to Out in the Past 2021. I'm Sue Sanders and I am the chair of Schools Out, which brings you Out in the Past. So we've also done LGBT History Month, which of course is every February, and I hope you've enjoyed some of the events that have been online for that. And we also produce something called The Classroom, which is specifically for teachers, which has over 80 lesson plans that usualize LGBT across the curriculum. And of course, you're at an Out in the Past event, which is very exciting. This year's theme for History Month was Body, Mind and Spirit, uh, which is part of the personal, social and health education for schools. And uh, because we are schools out, we care very much about linking up with the curriculum. We have badges every year. This is our main form of funding. So you can see all the different badges we've had across all the years. This is LGBT History Month's 2021 badge which is available still. You can go onto the website and you can buy badges and lanyards and, and we'd be thrilled if you so did so. So Out in the Past is our international festival. We're in England, Northern Ireland, Ireland and New York, which is very exciting. This is the team that brings it to you. It's Dr. Jeff Evans was the person who came up with the idea and we're very grateful to him for doing so. Every year we are, send out a call for papers and that last year we had over 70, it was very exciting. And Caroline puts them in the Gazette and sends them to all the hubs. And we had 18 hubs this year, which was very amazing given COVID and everything else. Lila has done all the technical training, so taught us how to use Zoom, taking the presenters on how to record their events and help the hubs set up their Zoom festivals. Jenny does the website, the Out in the Past website. So when you've been on there, you've seen her handiwork. Maisie does all, a lot of promotions for us and helps us in the background. Steve does all the theatre for us. And of course, this year this hasn't happened, but we're hoping next year we will have an amazing event. And Ken does our academic conference, which we're just beginning to plan, hopefully, for September 21. So I'm hoping that you feel part of it. You had an amazing opportunity in February. But if you go to the LGBT History Month website and go to the YouTube, you'll see all sorts of potential possibilities of being able to read to see more of the events that you, you may have missed. Um, and there'll be the events that Outing the Past have done also will be put up both on the LGBT History Month and also the Outing the Past YouTube. So sit back and enjoy and I hope you have a great time. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome to this year's Outing the Past Hub hosted by the Museum of Free Dairy. We have a great lineup of presentations today to celebrate LGBT history and activism. First, at 12 o'clock, Dr. Jeff Evans will be talking about the queer Keeley at the Martin Forsyth in the early 1980s, when the first student LGBT conference at Queen's University was picketed by Ian Paisley's Save Ulster from Sodomy campaign. The conference delegates, in an act of solidarity, were invited to a Keeley at a West Belfast bar. Next up, at one o'clock, Brian Lacey will give a talk on Ireland's queer history, drawing on evidence from early Irish law tracts, poems, prose and sagas to give a fascinating insight into the intimate and emotional queer lives of medieval Ireland. Our third presentation of the day, at 1.45, will be Amy Findlay, Elspeth Fisher, Nadine Gilmore and Siobhan O'Mahony on Women's News, Belfast lesbian involvement in the women's movement of the 80s and 90s. This will look at the involvement of lesbian women in the wider women's movement through historical accounts drawn from women's news publications. The last pre-recorded presentation today at 2.30 p.m. will be Brendan Nellis discussing the life and legacy of his late brother, Tarlick McNellis. We're especially glad to be hosting this presentation today because Tarlock was a great help to the Museum of Free Dairy when we were setting up the Queering the North exhibition and he donated his extensive archive of LGBT and Republican items to the museum. To finish off, all of today's presenters will join us for a live Zoom discussion at 3.30pm chaired by Dr Richard O'Leary. They will be happy to answer any questions raised by their presentations. If you would like to join us, and we hope you will, please email seminars at bloodysundaytrust.org for an invitation. We hope you enjoy all of today's presentations. Thank you, and let's begin.
Hello, my name's Jeff Evans, and I've been kindly asked by out in the past Derry London Derry to make my presentation entitled Queer Cayley at the Marty Forsyth, which was an event that occurred in Belfast in October 1983 at Turf Lodge at the Martin Forsyth Club. The story begins a number of years beforehand when the National Union of Students set up an independent or semi-independent NUS Lesbian and Gay campaign conference and campaign. The conference happened every year and promoted the LGBT plus, as we might know now, agenda and movement. The conference petitioned and passed motions at a number of its conferences to have its next conference in Northern Ireland. This was specifically to highlight and address the absence of the Act of Parliament called the Sexual Offences Act 1967, which had been barred from applying to Northern Ireland up until then, and was the first real attempt to decriminalise sexual behaviours between men, which hitherto had been criminalised from the 16th century. Each time one of these resolutions was passed, the National Executive stopped that resolution being enacted. So it wasn't until the Easter Conference of 1983, and this was a conference of all NUS affiliates, that a motion on lesbian and gay was tabled, which included Amendment 5 which called on the National Union to respect the decision of the Lesbian and Gay Conference and convene its next annual conference in Belfast. What was very interesting about this debate was the national president at the time, Neil Stewart, the Labour Party candidate of Knowles, spoke against the amendment, urging that the NUS Lesbian and Gay Conference resolution be ignored. Needless to say, he was ignored and conference upheld the right of the NUS Lesbian and Gay Committee to have its next conference there. That was not the battle over with. That was just the next phase, but the closing phase of that battle. What we had to do was then make sure that the NUS could not cancel the conference for lack of people registering, i.e. not enough delegates. And all in that summer, we campaigned as hard as possible in the grassroots to make sure that enough people were registered and that NUS would not cancel the conference for other means. And I very clearly remember a meeting at NUS headquarters with senior figures from the National Executive saying all kinds of things like all the lesbian and gay delegates will be machine gunned down or otherwise harassed while they're there. Clearly, the NUS executive had an agenda of what they would say, not rocking the boat, leaving the issues of the conflict and the protests in Northern Ireland well away from them. And we've got to remember the historical context of the Northern Ireland called the Troubles. We in England Wales and Scotland had a diet for years that really just portrayed Northern Ireland as a very violent place, didn't really differentiate between different sections of the community, just that they were violent and this is no place to go. Which in itself was quite daunting for us delegates going over, but there was a political principle here. We had to show solidarity with lesbian and gays and their supporters in Northern Ireland. What Manchester NUS did, known as Manus, 
we ensured that when the registrations opened for the conference, that we had at least 50 people to register. Even though the conference was scheduled very, very early to limit the promotion and therefore registration and had a registration cost I think it was about twice the normal amount. I remember the registration cost is for four meals and the right to sleep on a bit of carpet of crash accommodation. That was all. I remember us ringing the airlines to see if we could charter a, a plane from Manchester to take all de delegates over there. Needless to say, we got there. And what we got to remember too is the opposition faced by lesbian and gays and their supports in Northern Ireland. There was a, a well-organized campaign called Save Ulster from Sodomy, which united both the Catholic and the Protestant sections of the community. No Sexual Offences Act. In fact, a quite desperate situation. However, there was a political development that us lefties in England wanted to promote. That was the move of the Republican movement towards the ballot box. And we felt that was an extra reason for going over there and trying to normalize inverted commas and address some of the barriers to discourse that uh, was a feature of the Northern Ireland situation, mindful that members of parliament's voices were, were not allowed to be heard on the BBC. So we eventually arrived one very wet and cold October evening at Belfast after going through all the security checks to the conference venue which was Queen's University Belfast Student Union, um, the building in the picture there that has recently or is still being pulled down for a new one um, but it still has fond memories. And on arriving there, we were met by Ian Paisley's Save Ulster from Sodley Gang, including uh, Mr. Robinson, um, who I understand is, a, is considered a states person of his own organisation. And it was pretty lively, to say the least. We had about 150 to 175 protesters, Save Ulster from Sodomy, and we'd already been shot as English delegates by the sight of soldiers on the streets, armoured Land Rovers, only to be met by this welcoming committee. However, we also met a remarkable person um, and the counter demonstration is with him. This picture from the Belfast Telegraph shows the protesters, but it also shows Talapa McNellis with his Save Sodomy from Ulster t-shirt and um, he'll feature a little bit more in this presentation. Needless to say when we arrived and got through this picket we were a little bit shaken to say the least and the following morning the Belfast newsletter and other newspapers carried stories of the protest. At the beginning of the conference on the Saturday morning, we were informed that the Irish question could not be discussed at all, that if we attempted to do so, the be, conference would be closed and we would be chucked out onto the streets. I, as one of the people who'd encouraged and assisted a large portion of delegates to Belfast, approached Pete O'Neill, who was the president of the Students' Union there, who informed me that NUS were paying the bills and if they said the conference is over, the conference is over. It was quite a fractious first day, but during the course of the day, Tullock came up and said that we'd got an invitation to all the delegates to attend a Cayley in somewhere called Turf Lodge. I'd heard of Turf Lodge, and what I'd heard from the British press wasn't encouraging. But what was important is that we showed solidarity. We accepted the invitation 
and there's a very large visible group of queers, we were visible in the community, not just in the student union. What happened then was remarkable. Black taxis appeared and approximately 20 to 30 delegates got in the taxis and sped off to West Belfast through barriers, through police checks, all kinds of things, all foreign to our eyes. And we were received at the club with applause and given a place of honour next to the stage. No. Given all what we've been fed up through the British media about the Northern Irish, this was not the reception we'd accepted. We'd already had some reception from the Paisleyites outside the conference venue the day and night before. We weren't expecting this. And we were all in shock a little bit. And after a few drinks, we relaxed. And it was just like being in the miners' welfare in my own village except we were out and queer and being welcomed. And I remember needing to go to the toilet and seeing if other delegates would go with me and they were all quite happy to stay there, you go. So I managed to go to the bar and try and hide myself through the crowd on the bar and go to the corridor where the toilets were at the other end. So I'm there at the urinals having a wee and a group of lads came into the toilets the corridor being used by the youngsters to stay away from their parents. And the question was, in an accent I won't even attempt, was, are you one of the queers from Manchester? To which I had to make a decision. Should I wait till I finish weeing and then get beaten up, or answer no and get beaten up while I'm weeing? Obviously, I couldn't hide my accent. I obviously was one of the Manchester mob. On answering yes, the inexplicable happened, which is as vivid to me now as it was 30 years ago. The lad said, did the police hassle you as much, or the peelers, as we call them in Belfast, as you might know, hassle you as much as they do us? And that was revelation. That was incredible. In that one question, there was acceptance of who I was, a respect for who I was, and an affinity. Do we have the same problems? And I must have sat talking to these young lads for about five, 10 minutes. And that was doing my head in. This is not what I'd expected in my wildest dreams. So the evening went on, we done some more pints and they started doing this line dancing, Irish dancing, and we were clapping along. Only for the music to stop, and these gang of about 12 to 16 lads came over and asked us if we wanted to dance. I cannot convey, words fail me, in the power of that invitation, the welcome of that invitation. And all I remember was holding a hand of this absolutely dead gorgeous lad doing line dancing in a club in Turf Lodge and he's trying to explain the, the the moves and what the symbolism of the dancers and what have you and all I saw was people looking at me and clapping and smiling in what was a working men's club and I was elated. We somehow got back to the student union, God knows how, I assume the black taxis were waiting again and the following morning the threat of closing conference was no longer with us. So conference delegates started discussing the Irish question because we were in Ireland and passed a number of resolutions, including one that the next conference should also be in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. And all the minutes of that conference have yet to be found. The NUS wanted to forget that happened as quickly as possible. I'm pleased to say all the delegates I've kept in touch with from that time, they all remember it vividly. 
it changed our lives. And I showcased this presentation 35 years on at the first Out in the Past event held in Ireland at the Ulster Museum in Belfast. And that has since led to the creation of a play by Dominic Montagu and Kabosh Theatre Company, which was performed 35 years on in the Mounty Forsyth Club in the very place where the Cayley happened in the first place. The event was remarkable and all I remember sitting in the club and Teller could come over from New York where he'd moved to many years before, just crying quietly. It was an incredible performance and one that has rightly been shortlisted, it was shortlisted for the Times Theatre Awards. We presented the club at the end of the first performance with a presentation of thanks and celebrated with the production team, the cast, afterwards. The picture there is of me and Tulloch entering the, what is now the Trinity Lodge Club. That was the Marty Forsyth, 35 years later. We've, uh, we've grown a little bit since then. And unfortunately and very tragically, Tulloch died in April 2020 of the virus. And so hence the Queering the North exhibition of which the Queer Cayley is part is dedicated now to him. I hope you've found this presentation of interest and I'm quite happy to answer questions about it. Thank you for listening. <laughs>